This morning we're going to talk a little bit about obesity drugs. And uh, I think you can see that there. If I can turn sideways, this screen doesn't show up very well. Um, so what we'll be discussing this morning is, first of all, the, the role of uh, drugs in treatment of obesity and their role in the treatment. Um, and then there, have been, there are two drugs, um, fentramine and Orlistat, that have been present <coughs> before uh, 2012. There are two new drugs that were approved in 2012, a combination of topiramate and fentramine and another drug called lorcasrin. And then there were two new drugs approved in 2014. One, a combination of bupropion and naltrexone, and the other, uh, a drug called liraglutide. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about some drug combinations and drug in, that's in development that I think offers uh, uh, some optimistic uh, <coughs> future treatment. So uh, medical treatments are usually thought of in a sense of risks and benefits. So we like to use medical treatments that have the highest benefits and the lowest risks. And since eating a healthy diet and restricting calories in someone who's overweight and increasing one's physical activity is healthy, uh, that should be sort of the basis for the treatment of obesity. And then other things like medications, which can have side effects, are things that can be superimposed on diet and physical activity. So it does, the drugs don't make the diet and exercise uh, obsolete. Um, <clears throat> the way that drugs for chronic diseases are developed usually starts with surgery and then progresses to things that act on the brain and then to combinations of drugs in lower doses to reduce side effects and then finally to drugs that actually act on the uh, uh, places that we think are, they actually need to act to reverse the chronic disease. And <clears throat> the uh, uh, obesity is now considered a chronic disease. It was considered bad habits when I was in training. And uh, we're going through that progression and the way that drugs have been made. Uh, some of the uh, drugs that are recently approved are the combinations that reduce side effects and uh, maintain the efficacy. So Orlistat is one of the drugs that uh, was approved for long-term use probably the first one that was. Uh, the drugs that were approved after 1985 uh, are, were approved during the time when it was recognized that obesity is a chronic disease and chronic disease medications need to be treated, need to be taken chronically. Um, <clears throat> Orlistat was approved in the late 1990s uh, and it blocks the digestion of a third of the fat in your diet and then that fat then goes out into the stool. There, there are two dose forms, one by prescription, that's 120 milligrams three times a day, and another that you can buy without a prescription over the counter that's 60 milligrams. And you can kind of think about Orlistat for obesity in much the same way you might think of water pills for the treatment of high blood pressure. Uh, water pills cause a little bit of sodium to go out into the urine. It reduces the amount of fluid in the system and reduces the pressure in the system. Whereas with this, you're losing calories into the stool. The side effects, however, of having oil in your stool is that sometimes it leaks and sometimes people have accidents from it. And so this has been one of the impediments to making this a very popular drug. This uh, shows the weight loss. So on these curves that I'll be showing you, the, the top line is diet and exercise. And of course, it's taken along with a placebo pill. <clears throat> and then here's the dose of Orlistat that's sold without a prescription. 
here's the one that's sold with the prescription. So if you look here at about 24 weeks when the uh, weight loss is probably uh, at its maximal, you get about a 3% difference between the diet and the drug and in the prescription dose and about a 2% difference or 2.5% difference in the over-the-counter dose. Uh, the other drug that was was available to us and still is, but it was available since the 50s, is fentermine. And, and it's one of actually two old drugs that's available. Uh, diethylpropion is also available, but less often used. And uh, <clears throat> these drugs are stimulants. They're related to amphetamine, and so therefore they can cause sleeplessness. Uh, the original dose that uh, is used was 30 milligrams a day. Now in some of the combinations, about half that dose is used. Uh, it was approved in 1959, and because it's now generic and it's inexpensive to make, it's an inexpensive drug. And it's now, for many, many years actually, has been the most prescribed uh, drug to treat obesity. But because it was uh, approved prior to uh, when we understood that obesity was a chronic disease and not just bad habits, it was only tested and approved for about a 12-week period of time. That was because habits were thought to be something that you could change, either reduce the ones that you have or develop new ones over about 8 to 12 weeks sort of with the thinking that, you know, if you want to learn to ride a bicycle after 12 weeks at least, you can take the training wheels off. So the question has become, is there a way to use this uh, short term and still treat a chronic disease? So in the yellow line, you have the people who've been taking the fentramine every day for nine months. And in the blue line, you have the people who took fentramine for a month. They stopped taking the fentramine for a month, and then they started again. And you can see it's much more of a sawtooth pattern, but they end up at the same place. And so this has been thought to be one way to use this drug within the constraints of the package insert. Well, <clears throat> many of you probably remember that in the 90s, there was a a lot of excitement in the obesity treatment field about the combination of fentramine and fenfluramine called fenfen. Well, <clears throat> fen, one fen was fentramine that we just discussed, the other was fenfluramine. And both of these uh, drugs were approved uh, before 1985 and they were approved for short-term use and tested over that period. And uh, both of them act in the brain to reduce appetite, but they do so in different ways. One works on a different chemical pathway than the other. So if you use fentramine by itself, it gives about a 7% weight loss. If you use fenfluramine by itself, it does about the same thing, but if you combine them, you get about a 15% weight loss. So that was what was so exciting about this combination. Uh, but because uh, people then started using it chronically over a long period of time, it became clear that uh, the fenfluramine was having uh, damage to the heart valves. And so it was taken off the market in about 1997. This shows you a curve of the weight loss with the fin fin. Here you have the diet and exercise group, and here you have the group that lost about 15 to 16% of their body weight. And so because it was such a successful treatment from a weight loss perspective, people wanted to, uh, to try and recreate that in a safe way. And it turns out that fenfluramine stimulates the serotonin pathway. That's a chemical in the brain that's involved with appetite. 
and it's sort of a non-specific stimulator of that whole system. But there is one receptor in the brain called the 2C receptor that is the one that acts on appetite. And there's another one called the 2B receptor that's on the heart valves. And so what lorcasrin is, is it's a new medication that acts just on the 2C receptor and not on the 2B receptor. So it should be like fenfluramine, but without any heart valve problems. And so this was a, a, a study that was done uh, partly here at Pennington by uh, Steve Smith, uh, who was here at, the, at Pennington at the time. And here you can see that this is the diet and exercise group. And this is the lorcasrin group, which clearly lost more weight, about 4% more weight. And here, what they did is the people who were taking lorcasrin got divided into a group that continued to take lorcasrin or a group that was then put back on placebo. So they were just like this group up here. And what happens is that the weight comes back on. It's, so the principle is just like if you have blood pressure problems and you take a blood pressure medicine and it works for you and you stop taking it, your blood pressure goes back up. Well, the same is true with, with weight problems, but it just takes a longer period of time to do that. And so we just finished a study here at Pennington looking at the combination of this lorcasrin, which was recently approved, and uh, fentramine. And it was only a 12-week study because fentramine was only approved for 12 weeks, and we wanted to try it out at a, within its package insert first before uh, going further. But one loses about two-thirds of the weight one will lose at six months at the 12-week at the period of time. And so what this shows is that the lorcasrin, as I mentioned before, gave about a 4% weight loss. If you gave 15 milligrams of fentramine, it caused about 7% uh, weight loss. But then if you added uh, the full dose of fentramine, you got about uh, 8 to 9 percent weight loss. Well, that means that you would get a weight loss at the end of six months, presumably in that 15, 13 to 15 percent range. So this sort of suggests that the combination might be able to be used in, this, in a similar way to the way that FenFen was used and might give at least similar kinds of weight loss. This is a preliminary study. It's not approved as a combination, but I think that it, uh, it certainly needs more and longer term studies to show what it can do and, and how well it's tolerated long term. So the uh, fentramine and topiramine were a combination that was approved in 2012. And topiramate is uh, a drug that has been approved to treat epilepsy, and it's been also approved to uh, prevent migraine headaches. And in the process of using that drug, it became clear that it can cause weight loss. And so then they started to see if they couldn't develop it as a weight loss drug. But at the doses they had to use, people got forgetful. They couldn't remember names and where they put things and so forth. And so it just didn't seem like that was going to be a, an appropriate drug to use. And uh, <clears throat> the other issue that with this drug is that if women um, who are pregnant take it, it can cause cleft lips and cleft palates in their babies. And that's a significant problem because 80% of the people who use uh, these, these drugs, uh, obesity drugs, are women. And uh, so many of them have the potential to have children. So the next thing that was you know, here, this shows the studies that were done with topiramate. <clears throat> and here you have the diet and exercise group. Here you have uh, two doses, 
you can see here we're up to 100, almost 200 milligrams a day, which is what they use to treat migraine headaches. So the drug that was approved is called Qsimia, and it's a combination of topiramate and fentramine. And there are three doses, one that only has 3.75 milligrams of fentramine, the medium dose, with, which is a quarter of the uh, normal dose, 7.5, and then half the normal dose of 15. And that was with low doses of this topiramate at 23, 46, and 92 milligrams of topiramate. Well, topiramate can cause, whoops, excuse me. Topiramate can cause uh, tingling in the fingers and toes. It causes some dizziness, altered taste. Uh, insomnia may come from fentramine, but with the lower dose isn't a big deal. And constipation and dry mouth can be seen. But the big concern, as I mentioned, is that with this drug, the FDA says that the women who you know, have menstrual periods and have the potential to have children need to get a pregnancy test every month if they're going to be prescribed this medication. The, <clears throat> so here is a, a study that looked at the diet and exercise and the low dose that I described to you and here is the high dose, which gives about a 15% weight loss. And then here's another study that looked at diet and exercise and the medium dose group and the high dose group. The, high, the medium dose group lost a little more than 10% of their body weight. And so uh, lots of people think that this may be the best dose because it seems to have less side effects than the higher dose. Well, then in 2014, last year, there were two drugs that were uh, approved. One was a combination of bupropion and naltrexone. So bupropion is, is an old drug. It's been used to treat depression. And <clears throat> it's also been used to help people stop smoking. And it was known that it was associated with some weight loss. And for that reason, it's often used as the preferred medication to treat depression in people who have weight problems. And uh, it was discovered uh, in the laboratory that there is a chemical inside the brain that sort of acts like a break on the weight loss properties of this bupropion. And the thing that blocks that chemical is naltrexone. So here's a trial that looked at the diet and exercise group, a 300 milligram and a 400 milligram group of bupropion showing that doses in this range were effective in causing weight loss. And now Trexone doesn't give any weight loss when you give it on by itself in humans. And, but it has been used to treat uh, things that are, are addictive. It's been used to treat people who have alcohol addiction and addiction to narcotics. And uh, it works on blocking that chemical that makes bupropion not lose weight as well. So. Since naltrexone is used for addictive problems, alcohol and narcotics, and bupropion is used for smoking, which can be a form of addiction as well, this uh, seems to work at two levels in the brain. You know, there's a hunger center in the brain that things like fentramine work on to reduce hunger, but then there's also a craving center in the brain that's sort of related to addictive things. And so this works on both of those things. And there are people who will tell you that, gee, I just have really trouble with dieting because I just can't resist chocolate or I can't resist something else that you know, is particularly uh, important and that I crave. This is a, uh, a study that was, Pennington was uh, involved with. If you look over here, 
This is the people who took the drug in the studies and finished the studies. They lost about 8% of their body weight. Um, liraglutide is the other medication that uh, was approved in 2014 for the treatment of obesity. And it was already an approved drug to treat diabetes. It's an injection, just like insulin is an injection. Um, and it's given once a day. And what it does is it stimulates a hormone that helps reduce blood sugar, but only if it's elevated. And it also causes weight loss. And the major side effect is that in the beginning, it makes people feel a little bit uh, nausea or some people and uh, if you continue to take it then that that feeling goes away in most people um, and liraglutide was known to cause some weight loss but the dose for diabetes was only 1.8 milligrams so they began to test it at a higher dose 3 milligrams and showed that it caused more weight loss even though it really didn't have any more effect on helping diabetes and, and here's a study that, uh, here's the diet and exercise group. And, and here's the, the group that was on Orlistat, which we talked about before, it gave about a 4% weight loss. And so this liraglutide gives a, about an 8% weight loss, probably double what, what the Orlistat can give. <clears throat> so those are the drugs that we really have then they're approved to treat obesity. Uh, I thought I'd tell you about one drug that uh, is in sort of the second of the three phases of development for uh, treating obesity. It's called Belornib. And Belornib uh, is a drug that works outside the brain. And it does that to make the body burn up more fat. And it also decreases appetite. Um, in, in mice, it's very interesting that it returns body weight to the normal weight, but not below that. And a trial was done uh, in women, and it reduced body weight by 1% of their body weight every week for as long as it was taken. This trial that I'll show you was for four weeks. It's been tested as long as 12 weeks now. And they're getting ready to go into the longer term trials. Um, and because it works outside the brain, what's kind of interesting about it is that things that we could never really treat before, we now could treat with this. So there's a genetic uh, disease called prader willi syndrome. And those are the little children who get ravenously hungry and forage for food out of the garbage cans and you have to lock up everything and they live in group homes where everything is locked up and they can keep them from getting very obese. And a, another type of problem that we've never been able to treat well because it involves the hunger centers and all the other drugs act on those centers is the people who have pituitary tumors and they they destroy the, the, the centers in the hypothalamus that control um, appetite. But this drug has been shown to act on both of those things. So it's a real uh, step forward for these what are called orphan diseases. These are not common diseases, but they certainly are very difficult for, for doctors to treat when they get patients that have them. And this is just to show what happens with the uh, animals. This is a uh, rodent study. And here you can see this rodent is getting fatter on this diet. Then this rodent group is eating the same diet, but they're getting this medication. And this is the, the normal weight rodent. And these are very close together. So you see it brings it back down to normal. Now, whether it'll do that in humans or not, we don't know because it, the trials aren't long enough to, to show that. And people tend to think that that probably isn't going to happen because most chronic diseases, you have to add medicines as time goes on. 
but it is sort of interesting and will be fun to follow. Here is the, uh, the this, in this one trial that was four weeks long, 28 days, they didn't give any diet and exercise recommendations. Uh, they just gave a placebo shot. And uh, here you see that they didn't lose any weight if they were on the placebo. But here, the people who got the shots of belornib, which is given two or three times a week, lost 1% uh, of their body weight each week until it was, it was stopped out here at 28 weeks. So in, in summary, uh, the fentramine by itself gives about a 7% weight loss. The Orlistat gives a 3 or a 2.5% weight loss, depending upon whether it's a prescription or over-the-counter dose. Lorcasrin gives about a 7% weight loss, but, and the topiramate fentramine gives a 15% weight loss. Bupropion and liraglutide give an 8% weight loss. So we have a lot more to work with than we did just four years ago. Uh, there are drugs that you can use for sort of special circumstances. And uh, I just thought I'd briefly mention this. One is metformin, another is pramlantide, and another is onisamide, all of which are approved for other things. So metformin is a drug that's the drug of choice, actually, to treat people who have type 2 diabetes. And uh, there was a trial called the Diabetes Prevention Trial. So there's something called impaired glucose tolerance, which is the, an elevation of the blood sugar that's a little bit above what's thought to be normal and optimal, but not high enough to be diabetes. But the people who have that elevation, we know have a higher risk of developing diabetes. And so there were two groups. One was a diet group and the other was a, a, a group that took metformin. Um, the side effects of metformin are primarily uh, diarrhea, uh, and sometimes it can be bad enough that people can't take the drug, but most people can. And so this is a picture of this diabetes prevention trial, and this is the group that uh, uh, was on the placebo, and here you can see that the, the uh, metformin group lost weight, and it was somewhere between a 2 and a 3% weight loss over the course of the, uh, so I guess this is out to about four years uh, that this trial was followed. Now, pramlantide is another injectable drug. It's, it's approved for use in diabetes to reduce blood sugar. And it's been shown that uh, it can give a 7% weight loss over about 20 weeks. And it's sort of a, a mimic of a hormone in the body that comes from the pancreas, just like insulin does. So uh, when pram pramlantide gets combined with fentramine, you can get like a 10.5% weight loss. So that somebody who has diabetes and is on pramlantide and gets put on uh, uh, fentramine would lose more weight. The side effects, like many of these uh, hormone things, causes a potential for nausea that's usually mild and it usually gets better with continued use. When you put the fentramine with the pramlantide, the blood pressure doesn't go down as much, but it certainly goes down from what it was before the treatment because of the weight loss. And the pulse rate goes up just a small amount. This is a picture of the pramlantide and the weight loss that it caused. This is the diet and exercise group. This is the pramlantide group. And this was uh, a study that was done by Dr. Smith, who was here at Pennington. Uh, this is an, a study in which they gave the diet and exercise, or they gave pramlantide, or they gave the combination of the pramlantide and the fentramine. And as you can see, it caused a little bit more than a 10% weight loss. 
Uh, zonisamide is another drug that's approved for the treatment of epilepsy. And uh, it can give about a 9% weight loss when used at the epilepsy doses. Um, and it's been tested with bupropion at a lower dose, and that combination seems to be as effective a 15% weight loss as that combination of topiramate and fentramate. So here's the uh, trial that was done by Dr. Gotti, who's here at the Pennington Center. This is the, uh, uh, the diet and exercise group, and here's the zonisamide group that lost 9% of their body weight. And then this was at a lower dose. This was 360 milligrams of bupropion and the same amount of zonisamide. And at that dose, it caused a 15% weight loss. So the challenge is one of the big challenges that we have of treating obesity with medications was that we didn't have very many things to use. That certainly has gotten better. We, it's now recognized as a chronic disease, and we have more medications that we can use. One of the problems that still uh, exists but is starting to get better is that many insurance companies still don't recognize obesity as a chronic disease and don't cover obesity uh, medications. And when they do, they often include it in the high copay group like in, for drugs like that they call lifestyle drugs like Viagra. And so things are ever improving, the, the costs are lower with generics, that's like fentramine is inexpensive and inexpensive, and I think that's why it's used most. President Obama recently uh, covers obesity drugs uh, for the federal workers, so that's a step in the right direction, and things that the federal government does often trickle down to the rest of the country. And the two of the new medications have come out with a pharmacy plan where they say that nobody should have to pay more than 65 to 75 dollars a month for these medications. So we're getting some improvement in that. So in conclusion, it was just four years ago and there were only two medications that were approved to treat obesity. Um, now there are four, uh, two that came, two, four more actually, two that came in 2012 and two that came last year. Uh, then there are also medications that cause weight loss that are approved for other problems and combining them with weight loss medications can give greater weight loss. And cost has been a great problem, but that is improving, although I think it can improve more. <laughs>